Hi, this is Paul Turner with Venify, and today we're going to talk about public key infrastructure, or PKI as it's commonly called. You may have heard this term and wondered, what is a PKI? So let's get into this. To do this, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through kind of a scenario where we've got Bob here. He's got a web server. We'll, we'll call his uh, website bob.com. We've got Sally, and she wants to connect up to that website. She's going to put in her password, and so Bob and she want to make sure that that's secure. So Bob's going to go get a certificate for that website, for bob.com. So he goes to a certificate authority and uh, says, hey, I'd like to get a certificate. And the certificate authority needs to verify that Bob is actually allowed to request a certificate for bob.com. And so somebody needs to check that out or there needs to be some automated process for that. And the role that's assigned for doing this is called a registration authority. This can either be a person or it can be an automated process. And what that registration authority is responsible for is ensuring that Bob is allowed to request certificates for that particular domain, that they have control over that domain or he has control over that domain. Once a registration authority does that, then the, uh, they'll give approval to the certificate authority and the certificate authority will issue a certificate. It's not typically through the registration authority as I've shown here. It was just easier for me to get everything on the slide showing it that way. Now, once the certificate has been issued, just to cover terminology, the web server to which that certificate has been issued is the subject of that certificate. A lot like when you have a book and uh, there's a character who's the subject of that book, this, in this case, the web server is the subject of this particular certificate. Now, when Sally connects up to uh, the website now, the server will turn around and return its certificate, and she's going to rely on that certificate, right? She's, let's say she's connecting for the first time. She gets a certificate back, and what she's really looking to ensure is that she's connected up to the right website, that she's not going to be giving her password and other information to some rogue website. So she's relying on that certificate. And in that context, we call her the relying party. And this is very broadly used terminology in the industry to call her the relying party because she's relying on that certificate. Now, next you might ask yourself, okay, so she's getting the certificate. How does she know that that certificate's authentic? It's just, you know, this electronic document in a sense that she's received. And she does, in fact, need something from the certificate authority that she can use to validate that. In fact, as we'll talk about in a future segment, she needs to use their certificate or public key to verify the signature on that particular certificate. And you might think to yourself, okay, so every time that she's going up to get a certificate, now she needs to find the relevant certificate authority, connect to them, and then whatever they're going to provide, she's going to trust? Well, not really. It turns out that what happens is that the certificate authorities work with software manufacturers, whether it be Microsoft, Google, Mozilla, Oracle with Java, the certificate authorities work with them to embed their certificates, what are ultimately called root certificates, we'll talk about that in a moment, into software. And so this process of validating certificates is actually facilitated by the software manufacturers putting the relevant certificate authorities in the software. Now, later on, additional ones can be added by an organization or even by a user. But in this case, what we've got is we've got uh, the relying party leveraging the, the certificates that have been provided in the software to validate the certificate. Now, as the designers, and there's a variety of different parties and groups that have been involved with this, as they were looking at this and looking at best practices, they found that it actually made sense not to have the certificate authorities that were issuing all the certificates on a regular basis online and subject to attack, giving their root certificates to uh, the software manufacturers, what they found was it was actually best to have a different certificate authority, something called a root certificate authority, that could be used very infrequently. It would only be brought online to issue certificates to uh, issuing certificate authorities, sorry to use that term twice, and by virtue of that, then they could be taken offline, stuck in a safe, and very difficult to compromise. And this would allow for much better security because if, for example, we were using these issuing CAs and one of them got compromised, all of the software manufacturers would need to update their software. And that can be a very disruptive soft, uh, process. Actually, today it's is much easier than in the time that uh, all of this was being designed. 
So now, instead of the issuing certificate authority providing uh, their certificate, what happens is the root CAs, they actually, as they're setting up a root CA, they have to go through a very stringent security process to set everything up. And so they go through that entire process, then they get a required audit that confirms that everything that they've done is, is, has been done properly. They take this audit certification to the, the software manufacturers and say, will you put our root certificate into your software? And I believe for a nominal fee, most of the software manufacturers will do that. So now what we have is a mechanism where this relying party is able to take and validate that this is an authentic certificate actually issued from the certificate authority or one of the certificate authorities that they trust in their software. Now there's one final element that we need to put into all of this and that's determining if a certificate um, is in, in fact on an ongoing basis to be trusted because let's say that Bob who's responsible for this web server his, he's, he's got somebody rogue within his organization or somebody breaks into the organization and steals the private key associated with the certificate. Now Bob wants to tell everybody, hey, you can't trust this certificate anymore. I don't want anybody using it. And so what he'll do is he'll go up to the certificate authority and say, hey, can you go ahead and tell everybody that this certificate shouldn't be trusted? I'll, I'll get a new one from you. And so what the certificate authority does is they put this on what's called a certificate revocation list. Every certificate has a serial number, and the certificate revocation list is a list of all the serial numbers from that particular CA that can't be trusted anymore. For some reason, um, they can't be trusted, whether it's a private key compromise or some other uh, issue. And each relying party, based on the policies that each CA publishes, is required when they're uh, uh, taking and connecting up uh, to a particular site or using a certificate, they should go check that. Now, there's there's been some changes and best practices and such. We won't get into that in this particular session, but let's just assume that this relying party wants to validate that that certificate's still valid, and the way that they'll do that is to go check the CRL, the certificate revocation list, using uh, a what's called a CRL distribution point, which is just a public site where that CRL is available. Now, pulling down these CRLs, it turns out, over time became a very arduous process because the CRLs became very big, right? Some of the CRLs you, you'll find out there may be 30 or 40 megabytes. And so somebody uh, a few years back, actually uh, in the mid-90s, proposed an alternative protocol called Online Certificate Status Protocol that would allow somebody to just ask for the status of a single certificate. Instead of having to download all of the revoked certificates, they could just say, hey, is this certificate still valid? Or is this one still valid? And they could actually uh, ask for a group of certificates. But this would enable much more efficient requesting of status for certificates. So now what you start to see is that in addition to just being able to validate, is this actually a certificate that was issued from a CA that I trust? Is this still trusted? Because, you know, these certificates typically are valid for a year or two, but in the meantime, there could have been something that has invalidated that certificate. Now, in addition to the issuing CAs issuing CRLs, a root CA can also issue a CRL. Now, more recently, Google has proposed an alternative method for validating and keeping track of valid certificates called Certificate Transparency, or CT. And what they've really promoted is each certificate authority going ahead and publishing their issued certificates to this log so that everybody has a view of all the certificates. And even if somebody goes and issues a certificate that's bogus, now it's part of a public log and everybody can uh, check that and say, wait a minute, we're looking at this and this, this certificate, it's a duplicate of another one. One of them has to be invalid. So it gives a much better ability, a much better visibility. Now this works great on public certificates, but on private certificates, those that are used within an organization, it, it can provide more information than many organizations want publicized outside of that organization. So there's some places still where that's not applying. But what now you see is when you, when you think about or when you hear the term public key infrastructure or PKI, this is a PKI, all of it. Everything that you see, in addition, there's other things that you don't really see. When an, a certificate authority is set up, they actually publish uh, policies, a certificate practice statement, a certificate policy, 
And those are also part of that infrastructure. They're part of the legal infrastructure. All of these are required to make certificates work. And what you start to realize is that all of this is also part of the attack surface for certificates. An attacker who's trying to get a bogus or a rogue certificate may exploit any portion of this. They may exploit weaknesses in the software that's used to generate key pairs because that software isn't generating good ones. Debian had an issue back in 2008 with that. They may exploit the fact that the relying party software is not properly validating the signatures on certificates. So you can see there can be a lot of little cracks in this infrastructure that an attacker can exploit. So this provides you an overview of a public key infrastructure. Thanks a bunch for joining.